Hi everybody. This video we're going to speak about the Latvian counter gambit or the Greco uh, gambit. <clears throat> Greco counter gambit as it was known. What is that? Well, e4, e5, knight f3, f5. And we're going to speak about um, about this opening and uh, and use some Grandmaster games to uh, you know to uh, shed some light on this opening that you absolutely never ever see at uh, Grandmaster level. But it again, it's uh, popular at uh, club levels and. Um, Again, it's <laughs> I hate using the word unsound because it's it's like you're kind of like basically saying the opening is unplayable. But uh, again, I like to what I do like to say is if that openings like this, these early attacks on the uh, a white e pawn were any good, then e4 would just be absolutely unplayable, and we know that this is not the case. Okay. So the name of this video is going to be Grand Masters vs. the Latvian uh, Gambit. And it's uh, I couldn't find any games where two Grand Masters were uh, playing each other actually in this Gambit because uh, most GMs are not going to try this as black unless it's like a Blitz game or something like that. You know, so it's a lot of games where it's either Grand Master vs. Amateur or <laughs> Simon or something like that or... You there's a few international masters or masters that um, have tried it out as black. Okay, so let's let's talk about the Latvian counter gambit. Okay, what is it? When you see e4, e5, knight f3, f5, the first thing I want you to think of is this sequence right here. Right, it's, right. Everybody knows what that is. Right, that's the king's gambit. Okay. Going back to the position, so all the all the Latvian uh, counter gambit is is a reverse king's gambit, <clears throat> okay? And it's also called the Greco counter because it was originated by a player, um, uh, Gio Giancino Greco. I think I said his name right, and that was more than three centuries ago, four centuries now. Um, so it used to be called the Greco counter gambit until Latvian players got a hold of it. And, um, you know, basically revived it. You know, a player named um, Betting, I believe. Uh, B-E-H-T-I-N-G. Call, call Betting, I think. Uh, in the 1920s. So then, you know, they updated the name and called it the Latvian uh, Counter uh, Gambit. Right? So, he played a few games. Gave the opening a new, uh, you know, lease, lease on uh, life. Um, basically, just like in the King's Gambit. Uh, black usually has to be one to sacrifice material, pawns, you know, kind of playing uh, uh, unorthodox moves uh, in order to unbalance the position because usually his position is going to be bad. But if you can create enough confusion in the position for your opponent, then you can sometimes win because sometimes it only takes one or two moves to turn a, a bad position into a good position of equal or winning and um, so this is why this opening is very effective at lower levels because um, you know amateur players tend to make more errors at a higher rate than grandmasters you know a grandmaster game you might see one error per game you know and that's the decisive error and then you know, the game goes on, you know, the player gets a bad end game, etc. But at amateur level, you might see, you know, you know, five to ten errors in the game. Not major errors, but just my you know, positional errors that allow equality to be achieved. So black's basic idea is to create confusion in the position enough where white basically loses his footing because his 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 uh position is usually um, you know, kind of busted. Okay, and there's there's uh, several ways to face this opening. One is um, d4, um, which opens lines quickly, but it's not a critical line for Black. If Black can survive the early attack, he's in good shape. Um, you also have e takes f5, 
And the idea is basically what White is trying to do is strive for a good version of the King's Gambit, except it with, with colors reversed. Again, remember... Right? You know, just to go into these old school King's Gambit lines, right? And notice how Black Black here took the pawn, E takes F4, and then um, play G5. So now here, in the Latvian, right? Reverse King's Gambit. One of the ideas here is where White takes E takes F5, and he's thinking on the same lines to eventually be able to play moves like G5, excuse me, like G4, what have you. Basically, the same thing, but in reverse. Okay? Bishop C4 is one of the early, uh, you know, early critical lines, um, you know, basically, uh, Paul Keres was one of the, uh, you know, one of the people who analyzed this line. There's a lot of fireworks in the line. There's lines where Black gives up the, um, the rook in the corner. Um, you know, what have you. It's a lot of... Um, here, let me just let me just give you an example. So after Bishop C4, F takes, Knight takes, right? You got this uh, attack here. D5, taking the center. Queen h5, check, g6, knight takes g6, right, knight f6 is possible, but h takes g6, just give you the spirit of it, queen takes g6, and king d7, and it's just wild stuff, and it's actually black can uh, equalize there, here after Queen takes h8. Then you have king f7. Queen d4. Bishop e6. Bishop b3. Knight c6. For example. And again, the game is just full of uh, wildness. Okay. So those are like three main uh lines Here, here's here's the most important line and critical line as uh, as of today uh, the most um classically oriented line and that's just simply knight takes e5 and that's what we're going to look at all right i'm going to look at the grandmaster you know responses from from this right here this is basically the most difficult move for black to meet all right, so let's get started. This first game is from the Riga Interzonal. It was round 15. It's 1979, and it's probably from some guys you never heard of, but I know from just studying chess a long time. It's from the the white pieces, play with the white pieces, one, none other than Oleg Romanesian. Now, he has to be a grandmaster, right, with a name like that. That's like a super cool name, you know. <laughs> Oleg Romanesian, rated 2560 at the time. And that's very strong back in 1979 because, you know, we have rate, rating inflation. And a player with the black pieces, a player named Herman Van Riemsdyk, okay. And he was rated 2435. Again, not a grandmaster. I think he was an international master at the time playing the black pieces. And like I said before, it's hard to find GMs playing the black side of this. <clears throat> so game start off E4, E5, Knight F3, F5, and Romanesian opted for D4. Remember I said we weren't going to discuss it, but I just wanted to show you because it's a grandmaster game. So D4, F takes E4, Knight takes E4, Knight F6, Bishop E2, D6, Knight G4, and uh, Van Riemsdyk played Knight takes G4. I didn't like this move. I fig I felt this gave White an advantage. I 
And the reason why is because um, Black is behind in development here. So he should be trying to cure that, you know, cure that main sickness, which is being behind in development, right? He trades pieces, but White still remains ahead in development with the extra tempo. So for instance, just Bishop, simple Bishop E7, you know, just keep it moving. Okay, and black is or black is already fine here. Believe it or not, that's why these moves, you know, these moves like um, D4 and stuff aren't as critical. Black can black can um, come out, on, you know, uh, okay from there. So anyway, this game went knight G4, knight takes G4, bishop takes G4. Knight d7. The idea is to try to gain time with uh, knight f6. But it do doesn't work. Okay, now the e pawn is attacked. Knight f6, attacking the bishop. Oleg doesn't want to waste time, so he just captures. Castle. And here we could say that uh, white has a pleasant advantage. Bishop e7. <clears throat> bishop g5. Okay, just putting the pressure on the defender of the e4 pawn. Queen f5, of course, why not? Let's take it. And there's already difficulties here. For instance, we want to play bishop takes f6, right, if you're black, but then just simply knight takes e4. Because after queen takes, then you just win the queen. Really difficulties, see, and that's what happens when you fall behind in development. And of course, not queen takes, because knight takes e4 again. So, g takes happen. And this keeps the, uh, keeping the bishop here, protects this pawn for now. Queen e2, attacking the pawn again. And black basically has no choice but to give up the pawn. So he castles. And knight takes e4. Sorry about that. For example, if he tries to do this, right, <clears throat> f3, and again, White's lead in development is too much. He's almost forced to, to keep the position uh, closed here by playing e3. He got to give up that pawn. For instance, if he tries to slip away, then boom. Okay, rook attacks the queen. Queen got to drop back to e6. And now... <clears throat> White is in hyperdrive with full development. So anyway, at the queen e2, castle. White just won the pawn, and that was that. But um, again, that 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 didn't prove that the opening itself was bad. Like I said, just at the bishop e7, uh, black black is okay here. It's not too bad, okay. Because remember, I told you, this, this line is not too critical, this uh, D4. Playable, but it's not too critical. So we're going to move on. Okay, this game is from 1988. Between, actually between two grandmasters. One is uh, Anthony Costin. He's rated 25-15 at the time. And um, with the black pieces, a player named Johnny Hector, who was rated 24-15. Okay. And Johnny Hector plays these kind of openings, you know, real tactical uh, player. Plays these kind of openings as black, the offbeat openings. So knight takes e5. This is what I consider the most critical test for black. Queen f6. It's on main line. And again, just looking at it on general principles. Like say you came from, you know, the planet Neptune or something. And you, you know, you just, you know how to play chess. And you just seen this game, you know. Something suspicious is already going on. Just the fact that the queen is on f6 early in the game like that. Early in the game, early on in the game like that. Uh, should let you know that black, that black has, uh, you know, done something wrong. And that in a matter of several moves or so, white should be able to, you know, build a dominant position. So queen f6 attacking the knight. Just simply d4. d6 kicking the knight out. Knight c4, f takes e4. Now, black, again, taking the center, just like in the king's gambit, right? He wants to take over the center. 
Now here's the thing. The position is, is kind of semi-closed. There's some open diagonals, but not really any open files. And if black can um, keep the game closed and and then at the same time establish his pawns on, say, C6 and D5 and E4, he will have a good game. But unfortunately for him, in this opening, white's play is usually, when white plays correctly, his play is too fast for black to ever really get established, you know, in the center. And his position just deteriorates. Now here, normally, a normal move that's played is knight C3, just simply gaining a tempo against the um, this E4 pawn. Okay, yeah, ideas of here, even there at, at certain times, and then the queen will go here, making another queen move, but at the same time, putting pressure on this pawn, and then making a way for the knight to come out to F6. However, there's other moves you can do here, and Costin plays bishop E2, and that's designed against this move right here because of that right so queen d8 is basically the recommended move there is just get the queen out of there and then play knight f6 and bishop e7 so he plays d5 opting for more space okay now castle could have been played and then if d5 then the knight can hop back in there but again these type of openings usually white has some flexibility here because you can get an advantage in different ways. So Costin plays d5. Just taking more space. Knight f6. And also, you know, this pawn becomes somewhat isolated. Knight c3. Bishop e7. Bishop e3. Just normal, um, normal development. Hector castles. And knight d2, you see? And so now you can see the ideas behind the early uh, d5 is that he, for all intents and purposes, isolates the e-pawn. c5. And he just snaps off the pawn. Okay. And um, Costin went on to win that game. So like I said, white, white did not allow black to ever get his ideal center uh, set up. Okay, now this next game is from the black uh, perspective, and we have two strong players. Uh, one with the white pieces is Manuel Apicella, who's rated 24-35 at the time, and with the black pieces, none other than Ivan Sokolov, rated 26-30. So we see about a 200, um, 200, uh, yeah, 200 point uh, rating difference there. Okay, for the play with the black pieces, and this is from the European Championship in 1992. Okay, so after f5, knight takes e5 from Apicella, queen f6 from Sokolov, so main line stuff. d6, knight c4, f takes e4, and knight c3. Remember the last game I showed you, Costin had played bishop e2 in order to stop black from doing his next move, which is that. Notice how the king and queen are lined up. Now, if Bishop e2 was already there, then that move wouldn't be possible due to that. Now, Bishop f4. This is um, this move is playable also, and the idea is for black, excuse me, for white to play queen d2 and castle queen side. So it's pretty straightforward. But there's a critical move here, and I'll show you. You know, probably at the, probably the, for the last game. That's um, I think. Is, is probably the strongest move in the position here, which is, uh, I believe, f3. Okay, but f4, bishop f4, I'm sorry, knight f6, queen d2, and notice how the position is staying closed, so even though white is ahead in development, it doesn't mean anything because of the closed nature of the position, and that's that's why I like f3 better. Because in order to exploit this situation, the queen out early and the lack of development, you got to bust open the position. Bishop e7. You see how both sides are just developing. So this is a, so yeah, white has a slight lead in development, but this is allowing um, black to just basically get set up. And this pawn right here is annoying if, the, if it's allowed to sit here like this. 
you know, h3 which is a slow a slow move okay and now Sokolov you know now that the Kings are um, castled opposite sides he gets ready for his queen side his uh, queen side attack so a6 d5 and um, this move is not is not really necessary at this point I mean okay I mean, what is he worried about? This this move is not really, you know, an issue. Knight BD7. So after D5, we see now that these squares are available to black. King B1. B5 again, too slow. And now the counterattack comes. So we see that black's counterattack is already on its way. Where white hasn't really started anything on the other side. Knight b6. Okay, so now you got to worry about moves like knight a4, uh, knight c5, and you got to keep an eye, excuse me, knight uh, a4 or knight c4, you know, opening up the b file. a3, knight fd7, g3, again, just too many uh, slow moves. Knight c5. Bishop g2. And so now we see all this pressure on this pawn. Again, the idea with d5 is the same as I mentioned in the other game. It kind of causes this pawn to be isolated for all intents and purposes. But here's a tactical uh, strike right here from um, black. Plays rook takes f4. Of course, not... Uh, G takes F4 because of the G2 bishop. This means that Queen takes F4 must be played. And now we gain time by playing Bishop G5 against the Queen. Okay. Now where's the Queen going to go? So now you can see the Queen has been trapped. So Bishop takes E4. Knight takes E4. Queen takes <clears throat> e4 and now bishop f5 queen d4 bishop takes c2 check and now we see that black is in the driver's seat and those bishops are a killer and uh, Ivan Sokolov went on to win that game All right, this next game is between um, Vasek Relik, who is the um, who is an international master and the uh, creator of the Ribka program and uh, educated at MIT, so very smart guy. This game's from the Manhattan Chess Club um, in 1999, and at that time, he was just 22, I say just, 22.97. So he wasn't an international master yet, just uh, um, a master at the time. And he was playing a grandmaster, Yuri Lapshin, uh, who was a very strong tactical player. And he, he's a King's Gambit aficionado, as he was at the time. He was rated 2507. And so him being a lover of the King's Gambit, it's not surprising that he would try to play the King's Gambit in reverse against a player that was some um, 200 points below him in rating. Okay, so here's the creator of Ribka versus Grandmaster Yuri Lapshin. So e4, e5, knight of three, f5 is the most critical line. Queen f6, d4, d6, knight c4, f takes, knight c3, queen g6. And remember, the last game I had showed you, white had played this line, bishop f4, which is playable. But I don't think it's the most critical. This is the most critical line. Again, white is ahead in development. You want to start a fight. Open the position. Okay, if you can open the position, he only has his queen on g6. So you want you want you want to start the fight while you have the superiority in numbers. Bishop e7. Right? White basically I mean black basically has no choice but to keep developing. He can't afford to take this pawn. 
e takes f3 queen takes f3 say he tries to trade queens that's you know one of his only attempts to try to survive you reject that black is in trouble notice the difference with the, the files being open okay this is why black does not take there so after f3 bishop e7 she gets uh, open but only one file is open as opposed to two files being open. And the time that white takes to capture gives black a little bit more time to develop. Knight f6, but he's still down a pawn, you know. And here, Raylick played queen d3, protecting the pawn, which, it, which again, is playable. I mean, he has a nice uh, center and all of that. But here, but again, here's the test. Here's the critical test for black. E5. Again, he can't really take. Okay. And say after queen h5, takes, takes, attack the knight. This is just all good for uh for white. He's just up a pawn, superior position. Right, black has no compensation. So at the E5, critical line, it's like knight G4. Because black, all black can really do is try to gambit, right? And try to try to gambit and create, again, just like the uh, the white side of the king's gambit. Sometimes you have to sacrifice pawns, pieces, to try to create enough cloudiness in the position where a player can go wrong. Bishop D3, attacking the queen, queen H5. Notice how castling is prohibited because of the of this move. See, and now you're fighting for the initiative. Notice, so knight d5, threatening to check here. Bishop h4, check. The position gets really crazy. King d2, castle, and then knight takes knight takes c7. Okay. Now this position might not be everybody's cup of tea, but white is win white is winning here. Okay, but with that said, you can see why players sometimes instead of playing f3, they'll opt for this line, which is a little more clearer. Okay, it's less insidious, but bishop f4, queen d2, castles queen side is a little bit um, easier to you know put your mind around. So in this position, Raylick played queen d3 instead of, like I said, the stronger e5, but that creates a lot of complications. So queen d3 is playable here. Castle, knight e3, knight c6, bishop d2. And here, black, you know, black is not doing so bad at this point. For example, after knight g4, Piece has to be traded because of this threat right here. It helps black develop. And cuts off his intended idea of queenside castling. So that means bishop e2 has to be done. And then you can trade off some more. Or you can choose to put more pressure on the d pawn. Okay, so black's not doing too bad after that. Okay. Remember, just having pawns in the center is not enough. If they become immobilized, then they become a, a liability. So say after bishop takes, and I don't know, knight takes, things become interesting after this. I don't know if that's a poison pawn or not. But anyway, suffice it to say that black is, is not doing too bad there. But instead of knight g4, which is the natural move. He plays 
bishop g4 right and this gives I mean he all he's doing is basically trying to cut off this queen side castling and probably anticipating a move like bishop e2 however the simple simply h3 forces the issue here now where is the um where is the um bishop going to go so if he goes there oh g4 okay so the tactical <laughs> tactically minded grandmasters sticks the the bishop in right in the uh right in the in the frying pan so to speak right now the idea of course is to play this move he also could have just went back but you know that's uh that's admitting that your idea was just totally wrong and after this white is much better strong center um fully developed and uh Gonna build up a good position. So Lapson didn't want any of that. So he decided to create a tactical slugfest, figuring that he might be able to outplay his opponent here. So if the G takes F3, Queen G3, and of course, if <clears throat> King D1, then this is good for um this is good for black right here. Because he wins the rook and picks up the rook in the corner. So, king e2 is forced. And now here's more combinations. Knight takes e4. Again, not f takes e4 because that would just be made in two moves. Okay, so it gets real serious. However, queen takes e4. Now we see another sacrifice. Rook takes and Bishop E1. So all of this seems to be based on a big miscalculation. Again, the idea here is if Queen takes, then you have this fork here. Knight takes D4. Okay. So. Raylick is finding like the only moves here in this position. Now, rook takes, queen takes. And then the game starts to fizzle out as um and after that white uh black resigned as the attack fizzles out and black drifts into a lost position. So that's the if you're gonna play this as black, that's the way you have to play. You have to be willing to sacrifice material. Now, of course, this is based on miscalculation, but again, you're playing over the board, and if Raylick missed one of those moves, you know he was able to find you know the moves he had to find. But if he had missed one of those moves, then you know the game would have been a brilliancy uh, for black. But if you are gonna play this as black. You have to realize that you are going to be down pawns. Um, you might have to sack a piece or something. Um, and your basic strategy is to try to make the position murky as possible. You know, get familiar with the tactics in the position and make the uh, position uh, dirty. You know, don't give your opponent like a clear path to where he can just, um, you know, develop his pieces, castle. You know, just control the center, etc. Because then you'll be losing. So even though Lapshin lost this game, um, it was a you know a good attempt and and a good example of how to approach this is black. All right, but at the same time, the player with the white pieces is rated 2,300 approximately, 200 points lower than the GM, and he was able to uh, to beat him. So my conclusion on this opening is that. It is a difficult opening, and um, if it if it is um, again unsound is a strong word, but if this opening probably is pretty close to being there, to to being uh, unsound. A uh, good blitz, good blitz weapon, maybe good short time control weapon, but maybe not in a serious you know game, um, you know to play. I'm gonna show you one more game. 
and um and then that will be it for this this opening right here okay okay so here's the final game in this uh, survey and we're gonna hopefully give you an example that's gonna stick with you as far as this opening is concerned so this game is between Joseph Henry Blackburn right British player known as the Black Death and it's from Melbourne a simul 1885 versus a player named Shamier or Shamier <clears throat> Okay, so after our f5, knight takes e5, queen f6, d4, d6, knight c4, f takes e4, blackburn with, with knight c3. Note knight e3 is possible, rec recommended by uh, Nimzovich, with a different plan in mind, which uh, with c4, knight c3, um, which is also playable but more in a positional um sense I like this this uh, setup because it's more uh, direct so again let's just take quick stock of this position all right black has taken space from white in the center okay why do I say that he has this e pawn here sitting in the center and he's used this pawn d6 to drive the c4 knight away so he's taking some space from white in the center at the cost you know there's a price associated with it the cost of development okay so that's his main problem is that he's behind in development he's gotten this little space in the center but he has to consolidate that weakness okay so his object is to try to protect the queen of course right or he could trade the e-pawn and then in the place c6 Okay, so there's queen g6. All right. So, now, black wants to maintain its center. Right? But the lack of development and exposure of the queen, right? Just to protect just to protect the point of e4. Right? It's going to it's going to um you know, cost them you know in the long run. Okay? So, Structurally, black is sound, but to me, there's two salient features in this position that are in great, of great importance. One is this uh, unprotected pawn on c7, and two is the open a2 to g8 diagonal. All right, and when you start putting these little, uh, you know, bits of information together, we can formulate a plan for white. Okay, one is to increase his lead in development. Okay. Until he can exchange that, you know, that advantage for another advantage, you know, usually material superiority. All right. So that's basically White's plan. It's to increase his lead in development and try to open up the position. All right. So the main key, develop, open the position and attack Black on his weaknesses, which is C7 and on the that diagonal, the A2, the G8 diagonal and attack the queen on g6 all right so with that in mind f3 from blackburn okay that's the right idea blast open the position e takes f3 was played by sean here remember i told you that uh this move wasn't wasn't in the spirit that black should be playing in Queen takes f3, knight f6, bishop d3, natural and powerful, queen f7. Okay, so we see the queen is forced to move as black gains time, excuse me, as white gains time. Castle, bishop e7, bishop g5, it's a massive development lead also possible is knight b5 remember the idea of attacking c7 knight a6 bishop d2 castle rook a1 okay all right so after castle queen g3 was played now this 
93 is uh winning knight b5 again attacking the seat attacking the weakness c7 so the game just went as follows queen g3 knight e3 c6 rook f3 d5 and finally black kind of consolidates his center but white has too much firepower uh stacked up against him right now g6 see the queen side was weakened Excuse me, the king side was weakened as um, sacrifices on f6 loom in order to take this pawn. So g6 is played. And we just see the maneuvering against the queen side. Again, pressure against the f h7. So h5. And we all can probably see what's coming here. Knight takes h5. G takes getting rid of get, getting rid of defenders of the h5 pawn and this is just brutal and uh we see why they call them the black death <laughs> uh blackburn and so this is just an old school example of um you know how the masters you know, the old masters handled handled this type of opening. You know, they basically just did not give black any room, any room to breathe. You know, any room to consolidate this. And um, and this is basically the still the best way to handle this opening today. Of course, instead of queen f6, black has tried different things like knight c6. But... Uh, none of these moves have been able to um, resurrect this opening for black. For instance, after knight c6, queen h5, and then there's like this long gambit line um, that I'm not going to get into after g6, knight takes. But again, it's all smoke and mirrors because at the end of the day, black just sacrifices too much for not enough uh, compensation. And white is in the driver's seat. And um, so... That is it for this video. Hopefully you learned a little bit about the Latvian counter gambit. And again, if you you know, if you want to play it, play it. Like nobody's, you know, I don't think any professionals are listening to professional chess players are listen listening to this, but they will probably agree with my um assessment and conclusion of this opening that it's not quite sound for black. But um you can play it at blitz, you know, blitz or you know, minute game, bullet chess and stuff like that. And short time controls and um, you know there's a lot of tactics but be prepared to sacrifice um, and play very active if you are black just like you will be playing white in the queen in the king's gambit be prepared to you know to sacrifice everything to um, you know for the initiative so I hope you enjoy that P please like subscribe comment below if there's any other openings you know especially like the offbeat openings that you wanna um, want me to discuss, I'll be glad to uh, make a video about it. Because um, I know when I first started playing chess, I used to wonder why certain why GMs didn't play certain openings. You know, I'd be like, why don't why don't GMs play the Budapest Gambit, or why don't they play you know this and that? And um, you know, as I became stronger, then I started understanding you know the reasons reasons why. Especially if you have to make a living off chess, you can't afford to end up in you know, positions like this is black. If you, you know, you got to pay the rent, you know, in two weeks. Like, you need that tournament money. You know, you can't afford to be playing suspect, you know, openness. So, anyway, that's it. And I'll talk to you guys later.